Last year I built an external power supply for my Levelmate Pro leveler so I could power up from the RV battery rather than the internal button battery. I'll post a link here if you'd like to see the video for that project. After publishing the video for this project, a viewer asked if I could make a version that would automatically turn the leveler on and off. So, that's what this video is about. Due to the length of the project, I'm going to split this video into two parts. What is the Levelmate Pro anyway? It's an aftermarket device that you can buy and install in your RV that will help you level the RV at the campsite. It connects via Bluetooth to your smartphone and allows you to see if your RV is level or not. The advantage here is if you view the app while you're parking your RV, you can select the most flat spot at the campsite. Levelmate comes in two versions, Levelmate Pro and Levelmate Pro Plus, with Levelmate Pro being a bit cheaper. The major differences are the Plus version has a longer lasting battery, can be remote powered via USB, and supports Apple Watch. This project is not needed for the Levelmate Pro Plus as it already has its own external power connection via USB, so it would only be useful for the lower cost Levelmate Pro. So why is this project needed? Obviously the Levelmate Pro must be turned on to function. This can only be done with the on-off switch located on the module itself. As the module is often installed in a closet or behind an access panel in the RV, accessing the device to turn it on can be a challenge. Therefore, it is highly desirable to have a method that can turn the device on, such as from the cab of the tow vehicle. This would allow you to find the most level spot at the campsite before exiting the vehicle. There are two other levelers that are on the market that are similar. That is the Rhino Storm Leveler Pro and the Cori RV Leveler. Now you may think these are 6 volt levelers because they actually have two 3 volt batteries in them. But the batteries are wired in parallel which means that they can work with this device. In fact the leveler controller can output many voltages from 3.3 volts DC all the way up to 12 volts DC. However that requires a different set of components and since we are looking at this from controlling the leveler, we're only going to cover the 3.3 volts DC option, which will cover all three levelers I just mentioned. The utility nature of this controller means that it can control up to 12 volts DC, so something like a backup camera you could control with this as well. I'm not going to cover those connections in this video, but if you download the instructions from the website, it will tell you how to do that. We need to give this device a name, so from now on I'm going to refer to this as a leveler controller. Looking at the block diagram for the leveler controller, we see a 5 volt and 3.3 volt power supply, an output relay, a microcontroller, and an opto-isolated trigger input. When the microcontroller detects a trigger via the opto-isolator, it turns on the relay, which sends 3.3 volts to the Levelmate Pro, thereby turning it on. The trigger consists of a 12 volt signal, either momentary or constant. An opto-isolator is used to electrically isolate the trigger from the rest of the circuit. This project ended up being much more challenging than I first thought. I originally designed the project using a MOSFET output, a design that I've used many times. Unfortunately, due to supply chain issues, I could not obtain the correct components to make the device reliable. The design changes that I had to incorporate ultimately provided a more flexible device. Let's consider one example. Say the trigger is connected to the backup pin of a 7-pin trailer connector. Whenever the tow vehicle is put in reverse, the trigger picks up the backup signal and turns the Levelmate Pro on. Almost anything can be used for the trigger, including the backup, left turn brake or right turn signal, tail lights, an on off switch, or even a wireless relay module. All that is really required is 12 volts being applied to the trigger to turn on the Levelmate Pro. There are five different modes of operation available with the leveler controller. These will be discussed in video part two. 
Visit rv-project.com for a comprehensive set of build instructions for this project, including the build materials, step-by-step -step instructions, and so on. I will provide a link here for the web page. When you go to my website, you can download a PDF file that is basically the instruction manual. The first section of the manual talks about how the thing works. It explains the different modes that the level or controller can operate in. A schematic. We have a bill of materials. And here are some graphics on how to insert the components. We have a step-by-step -step instructions of how you put the components on the board. Drill templates. And then connection scenarios. And I run through several of them. I designed this project to fit inside of a BUD CU18425B enclosure, as you see here. Refer to the construction document on my website for the whole location that needs to be drilled out, and I'm showing that here for convenience. Well, here is a cool tip if you have a 3D printer, and you know, traditionally you would just uh, use a ruler and mark it out and you know, punch, center punch in the plastic. That's doable, but it really doesn't come out exactly straight always. So if you have a 3D printer, what I did is I printed out a template, and you can see the template has holes in it. Then I set the template on top of the case and drill out my pellet holes. And so now I have holes that are in the correct location. And after I drilled the four holes, I enlarged them as needed so that these LEDs and the switch would fit properly. And you can see on the back, I just have the wires kind of folded back on themselves. So that's what the box looks like. Now I went one step further, which you probably will not want to do because of the cost. I had Front Panel Express print out a logo on a piece of aluminum for me. And the reason you probably won't want to do this is this kind of doubles the cost of the project. But we wanted to make something look nice. I had these circuit boards made by a supplier, and I had them make a few extra as well. I will likely build two more prototypes that are fully assembled that I will also put on my website for sale page for those of you that may not want to build one. I will send out a notification when the items are on the for sale page on my website via my YouTube community page. So be sure to subscribe if you want to be automatically notified when they are available. I'm not going to do a step-by-step -step construction of the circuit board in this video. And the reason for that is because there's bound to be some design changes. Then the video would not be correct. So instead of that, I will keep the construction document up to date. And I'm just going to go through the highlights of what you need to know and how you need to build the board. I will begin by surface mounting the resistors because that is the easiest place to start. What I like to do is to tin one side of the component pad with solder and then take the component with a pair of tweezers and just kind of tack it in place. And you'll see that it's not flush. So then I take my fingernail and kind of push down and just quickly tack it again. And then it's flush. Then I turn the component around. Then solder the other side. And that's all there is to it. And again, this is not a step-by-step, -step, and I have a bunch more resistors to put in, so I'm going to pause the video until I do that, and then we'll come back for the next component. And now we have all the resistors on the board, and it's time to do the capacitors. One thing I would mention, though, is I always recommend buying more components, especially the small ones like this, than you really need, because I've had plenty of occasions where picking them up with the tweezers, they've shot across the room, You'll never find these things when they fall on the floor. And they're only pennies a piece, and the shipping is such that you're going to spend more money in shipping if you only have to buy one. So consider buying a few extras. Well, the next component is the capacitor, and they go on almost like the resistors. Now, one thing about the capacitors is I would leave them in the bag until you need them because they're not marked like the resistors are, so you could get them mixed up easily. 
And we'll do the first one like we did with the resistors by tacking one side of the board. And when you're done, tack the other side. Well, the next step we want to install a diode. And here's what the diodes look like. And you can see the diode has a mark on the left side. That mark will line up either with the arrow or the line on the board. And here, for example, is one of the diode locations. There's a symbol of the diode with an arrow pointing this way. There's also a thick line here and a thin line on this side. Both of those correspond to the line on the diode. And just like the other ones, we'll start on one side. It can be hard to see without a pair of magnifying glasses. The line is pointing towards the left. So that means I want to put the diode in this way. And there's actually three diodes on the board. They're here and here. Then when you flip it over, there is a diode on the back side. And I recommend when you're done soldering the diodes in, you double check the polarity to make sure that the line on the diode matches the line on the board. So now that we have the small components in the board, it's time to do the larger components. This opto isolator will have a dot on one corner or a groove cut into the component on one side or both and you'll see a dot on the board. You want to align those two dots up like that. And by the same token, the microcontroller socket here, there's a dimple right there. That dimple corresponds to the round mark, so it goes like that. We have the switch, and this switch is not polarity sensitive, but I recommend installing it so that the number one faces to the left when the board is oriented and it'll show one two and three on the board here as well and that just goes in there so we'll solder these components and then we'll continue on with the rest and while we're on the back side of the board there is something called a common ground that there's a couple pads here and if you're going to use this in an rv i would probably recommend doing that you can go into the construction document and it'll tell you all about the common ground whether you should use it or not but if you're going to use it in an RV, I would recommend using the common ground. Just take a solder blob and just put enough solder on there so that you jumper both sides of it. So what you're actually doing is making a circuit connection here. Just continue on uh, populating the board with parts. Next, uh, we can use this transistor. This is a 2N2222. And you'll see that it has a flat spot here on one side. That flat spot corresponds to the flat spot that we see on the board. And just push it in. And then we might as well put the other two semiconductors on here. And there are two different ones. We have a 78M05, which is a 5 volt voltage regulator. And you can see 5 volts here, so that's where the 5 volt regulator goes. And you'll see a thick line here on the silk screen. Well, that corresponds to this tab. So you see we have the tab oriented towards the right. So that means the component goes in like that. So the thick line corresponds to the tab. Well, this one says 3.3 to 12 volts. So this is where, when I said you only have to change usually one component if you want something different. So let's say if you want a 9 volt output then you could buy a 9 volt regulator but again the construction guide is going to show you that and then the other component is the 3 volt regulator and that goes the same way here so we're just going to install that one here like we did the other one matching up the tab orientation and the next component we want to install is the electrolytic capacitor and there is a minus sign on one side along with a short lead. They both mean negative. And then on the board, we have a positive mark on the left side. Then on the right side, we have two thick lines point to negative. So we know that positive is on the left side. 
So it's just a matter of putting the capacitor in. And what I like to do is bend one lead over until I solder it. So we'll do the same for the second capacitor, and these are both the same values. And if you get these backwards, uh, this will produce smoke with these electrolytic capacitors. And then the final component is the relay. And of course it'll only go in one way, like that. And the remainder of the holes here and here and all these, these are for the LEDs that go to the front panel. This is the input, and then here's the output, and here's the trigger. So all the rest of these will be done as we assemble this into the case. And next we have to program our ATtiny85. And this is a custom programmer that I made, and I made it out of a Arduino Uno. You don't need to use that. You can just use a breadboard, but you have to at least buy a Uno. And I'll put a link here to my website where it shows you how to create this and how to program the ATtiny85s. But we have the AT1085 here, and now we're going to upload the sketch. You can see the status light's blinking here, and now the sketch is uploaded. And the sketch is what they refer to the firmware file. I realize that programming microcontrollers is not something easily done for some people. I am offering to program an AT1085 for you. On the for sale page of my website, you can order a pre-programmed microcontroller for essentially my cost. I will continue this program until either I cannot obtain the microcontrollers due to supply chain issues, or it becomes abused, such as someone ordering large quantities of the microcontrollers for resale. Next, we want to install the three LEDs into the case, as well as the momentary local trigger switch. And the final assembly step is to connect the LEDs, the momentary switch, the input and output connectors, and installing the AT1085 into the case. Now that I have everything all soldered together and the board soldered, and right now I'm in mode 2, and we're going to flip it back to mode 1 just for a demo. And you can see we have power. Now mode 1 says the output will follow the trigger. So you see the trigger's on, the output's on. I let go of the trigger, the output goes off. So that's okay for a test, but I want to actually use mode 2. So I'll turn that on. Now the issue with changing modes is you have to power cycle the device. That is, turn it off and back on before it becomes updated. Because I designed this to only read the mode switches on initial power on. So mode 2 says that upon a trigger, the output will stay on regardless of the behavior of the trigger. And then 15 minutes after it received the last trigger, it'll turn off. So I'd say this is working. And this is just a snap-on cover. This completes the construction phase of the leveler controller, so I will stop the video here. In the part 2 video for this project, I will show how to connect the controller to the LevelMate Pro, RhinoStorm, and Cori levelers, as well as installing the project into the RV and using the reverse switch from the 7-pin wiring harness as the trigger. Visit rv-project.com